Good morning, and a warm welcome to our listeners here in the United States, in Africa, and around the world. My name is Aloysius Uche Odu, Senior Fellow and Director of the Africa Growth Initiative here at the Brookings Institution in the nation's capital, Washington, DC. Earlier this year, we launched the 2022 edition of our flagship report, Foresight Africa. Today, we are focusing on a thematic part of that report, which is the health chapter. COVID-19 is the most truly global public health crisis in modern times. It has laid bare the world's vulnerabilities to health and economic ruin. Indeed, COVID-19 revealed fundamental weaknesses and contradictions in global health. Trade, tourism, global supply chains were all disrupted. Many lives were lost and livelihoods across the world. As we enter the third year of the pandemic, there are still many, many un unanswered questions. What have we learned from Africa's experience with COVID-19? What is the status of vaccination on the African continent? How do we ensure equal access and self-sufficiency? Some experts believe that the next pandemic is not a matter of if, but when. Are we better prepared? To help us answer these questions and many others, we have assembled some of the world's leading experts on global health. They all contributed essays and viewpoints to our flagship report, Foresight Africa 2022, which we launched on January 26th this year. Viewers are welcome to submit questions to our panelists by emailing events at brookings.edu or via Twitter at Brookings Global. It's with particular pleasure that I now introduce our esteemed panelists. We have Ms. Tolu Disu, co-chair communications working group and member, board of directors, African Vaccines Manufacturing Initiative. We also have Dr. Christian Happy, Professor and Director, Africa Center of Excellence for Genomics and Infectious Diseases at Redeemers University in Nigeria. We have Dr. Chikwe Ihekwazu, Assistant Director General, World Health Hub for Pandemic and Epidemic Intelligence in Germany. We have Stephen Karingi, Director at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. And finally, we have Dr. Mohamed Pate, Julio Frank, Professor of Practice of Public Health Leadership, Department of Global Health and Population, Harvard University. I bid you all a warm welcome. Okay. Let's start with you, Mohammed. You have three minutes, quick reaction to where we stand in the state of play on the health right now on the continent and globally. Well, thank you. Thank you, Aloysius and Brookings for convening this panel and also joining me with all these esteemed co-panelists. I think it's difficult to extract the issues of health in the African continent without looking at the wider uh, historical, but also current experiences of the continent in terms of its own development. Africa has always been a great continent in terms of the resources it has, human material, in terms of also the diversity of its continent culturally and in all aspects. But it is also true that Africa has been in the periphery of global attention. And what we have experienced with COVID-19 is only one more symptom in a series of episodes that have reinforced this idea that Africa is in the periphery. We saw in the Ebola outbreak, uh, some of the experiences that we can look at. And even before then with HIV AIDS, and several other daily outbreaks that used to occur on the continent and still do. And external forces played a significant role in the evolution of our politics, economies, but also our health systems. And the global attention usually tends to be on really diseases that are global in nature and Africa's priorities in terms of building systems have not received usually the 
highest levels of attention. And so development focuses on interventions rather than on building systems that are key. And we saw the manifestation of that in the context of COVID-19, which you alluded. So the pandemic has been a watershed moment, but we've also seen the rise of African institutions, national institutions, what Chikwe did in Nigeria, what John Gangerson did in the African Union, Africa CDC. The leadership of many African institutions came to the fore, more so than what we've seen in the past. So in the essay, in Foresight, which you invited us to contribute to, I laid out eight key action items because there is a part of the future of Africa that is present now. It's immediate. It's the unfinished agenda because the future is there, but the future actually is the present in the sense that we have huge burdens of maternal, newborn, child health, morbidity and mortality and systems to deal with them have to be developed. They're still fragile. That fragility is very evident. The inequality that we have seen globally, we also know that there are deep inequalities within our countries, and that undermines the fragility of the, uh, the, the capability of the state, the trust of the citizens because of the inequality. So inclusion is key part of that, and we should be intentional about that. The paradigm of curative care is certainly one that I don't think Africa really needs to uh, follow uh, because we can really tilt the balance and think about prevention and prevention broadly, not only pandemics, but non-communicable diseases. The innovations and the health markets that, are need, that need to be developed are all part of that. Uh, the governance aspect, it's not only sort of the global intervention tend to be very technical, but the challenges of health in the continent tends to be, it's actually requiring an adaptive really approach to think of it from the lens of governance, of institutions, of actors on really consensus in society, including everyone. And not only in health, but broadly in terms of governance on the continent, which your uh, initiative has been able to highlight. So those are some of the items that I hope that we can deal, uh, dip, dig deeper, not only on this panel, but on the initiative on the future of health and economic resiliency in Africa, which you, Aloysius, has been very gracious to participate among, along with several other leaders on the continent. So I'll stop here. Over to you. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Thank you. Those are excellent remarks. Uh, uh, Tudu, may we turn to you now, please? Yes, thank you so much, uh, Aloysius. And uh, warm greetings to my colleagues uh, on the panel. I'd also like to just acknowledge uh, Dr. Chidi Weneka, who also contributed to the viewpoint on which uh, most of this discussion would be based on in terms of my inputs and my thoughts. Let me start by saying that today, vaccine manufacturing in Africa is less than 1%. In some estimates, it's 0.1% of worldwide production on the continent. Yet Africa consumes 25% of vaccines globally and also contributes 44% of the infectious disease burden, many of which are, are of course preventable by, by uh, immunizations. So these are very abysmal statistics for the continent and with so much opportunity and with so much potential uh, for health, security and self-sufficiency, it begs the question, you know, why is this happening and how do we break this crippling dependency of foreign uh, external parties and mechanisms in terms of actually uh, having vaccine security? The answer really is that we must create our own environment to fully make our own vaccines. The future of vaccine manufacturing in Africa will require that we close gaps in funding of vaccine development. We also really need to look at upscaling our human capabilities, our human resources for health in vaccines development. And we also need to look at supporting market access and demand, enabling technology transfer and intellectual property and strengthening the regulatory framework. So all of these elements have to be underpinned by an unwavering political will. And these would only be achieved with ownership and sustainment by Africans in partnership with the international community for the benefit of all. Supporting and partnering with Africa in its vision of building sustainable human vaccine manufacturing is not about charity. It's about humanity and it's about making sure that Africa-based manufacturers 
can take a firm position in the global competitive space, just like other manufacturers are doing around the world. Governments, private sector, NGOs, most importantly, the citizenry of the continent all stand to, to, great, to gain benefit uh, greatly from local vaccine research, production, development, expansion, the whole gamut of the spectrum. These rewards, of course, would include health coverage, socioeconomic growth, industrial development, youth and vulnerable populations protection, and the advancement of the biopharma sectors on the continent. Thank you very much, Tula. Let's turn now to Chikwe. You have three minutes, please. Uh, thanks, Aloysia, and thanks, uh, colleagues that have joined us today. Uh, Aloysia, I'll keep my comments fairly simple. Um, we, we spent a few years building up the Nigeria Center for Disease Control when no one really believed the relevance it might be in a position to have. And I remember going around the country to our state governors, to the Nigerian private sector, trying to convince them of the necessity to build an ecosystem to prevent, prepare, and respond to an imminent threat. And sometimes I looked, people looked at me with the kind of look that you're given when you're speaking about something that is so uh, fictional and, you know, and sometimes derogatory because the you're put in the box of someone just looking for money uh, or relevance or something right um but we persevered and through very difficult circumstances we built up a small relatively small organization we were lucky to be in a position to be new so we could recruit mostly young people that could buy into a dream so we weren't encumbered by too many old civil servants that uh, you know, couldn't believe in a, a newer, brighter future. So that journey continued. But you know, I remember in early 2000, when I was privileged to be part of a small WHO mission that went to China for the first time, not the second one that got a lot of attention, the very first uh, mission. And seeing what China had put in place to respond to the early stages of the pandemic, um, I immediately knew we, we had our work cut out for us, um, not only in Nigeria, actually, but around the world, because it was really not a question of this health sector, but how do societies organize themselves uh, to respond and to achieve the compliance needed uh, to respond to a, a pandemic of this, of the scale it was at the time where it wasn't still yet. Uh, no one anticipated it would get to where it would get to. And I, I remember traveling back from that trip and, and not just about the, you know, the Chinese CDC was really literally a response to the SARS outbreak that happened early in my public health career. China did not have a CDC prior to that. So in recognizing where they had started from and how they had responded, we then led them to their level of preparedness this time around. Um, and, and reflecting on where we are in the country, and even if we wanted, even if we had the resources to do what we thought we needed to do, what was the agency that we had to do it and to enable the compliance, the skills, the supply chain and everything that we needed to implement was almost impossible. But, you know, to come back, we did the best we did. I, I think there are many circumstances that led to um, the, the response that we had. Um, uh, but ultimately, I think the, the key question for me now and for all of us on this panel is, is what, what lessons do we learn from this? Um, and what lessons do we really learn from it? Is it the one that is on the newspapers or is it what we know that we need to do? And mm -hmm. those are slightly different because yes, mm -hmm. I am excited about the efforts to build vaccine manufacturing plants and all of that. But yeah. we, we all know, everyone on this panel, that it's not 
a building, it's not a plant, it's an ecosystem mm -hmm. that includes the governance, the compliance, the skills, um, the sustainability, the market, mm -hmm. uh, the market shaping. So none of these problems will be solved in a few years, even a few tens of years. So are we ready? to make the longer term investments and use our voices to push for it. Because if we don't have this, the university system that can produce the scientists, and if we don't have the science institutions that can mentor the scientists, we can build a hundred vaccine plants in Nigeria. We will not find the human resources to carry out the very first steps of measures required for manufacturing. So yeah. in a way, I think, we, uh, we need to scale our thinking mm -hmm. and the scale of our ambitions and the scale of the challenge that we face. And if we don't do that, we will be pushing on, on the periphery mm -hmm. and celebrating uh, small successes rather mm -hmm. than yeah. defining the, the, the size of the challenge, how mm -hmm. far back we have fallen mm -hmm. in our trajectory and yeah. the, the scale of what we need to do to catch up, not to lead, to catch up with yeah. where we should be, uh, okay. where the founders of our countries anticipated that we should be by 2020, 2022, yeah. given their efforts in the late 60s. Right. Okay, no, thank you. Thank you very much. The need to scale up our thinking is really clearly emphasized. Christian, let's turn to you. Uh, three minutes, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Aloysius. And then uh, again, uh, greeting to all brothers and members of the panel. And mm -hmm. it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, basically, I will just build up on what um, uh, Professor Pate, Dr. Chikori, and then Tolu have said. Mm -hmm. And it's basically my own take is, is simple. And it is the fact that uh, Tolu mentioned Africa contribute 40% of mm -hmm. infectious disease burden in the world. Uh, Chiku mentioned the fact that yes, we need to reshape our, I mean, and redefine the way we think. And Professor Pate mentioned, you know, I mean, I've, I've talked about building a resilient health system and how mm. that is important, not only for uh, communicable disease, but also non communicable diseases. Mm. And these are very, very important things. And I do believe that, you know, within all of what we said, talking about non communicable diseases, talking about mm. infectious diseases, is actually demonstrating, you know, how rich Africa is in terms mm. of its own biodiversity mm. and how mm. we as a continent have not tapped on these, what I call opportunities in this guide that present as challenges. We have failed as a continent, you know, to leverage, you know, those pathogens that are part of our biodiversity and then, um, I mean, to, to lead the world in mm. developing diagnosis, therapies, therapeutics, and then vaccines. And yet, you know, uh, we have a unique opportunity or several opportunities in the past. But what COVID has really demonstrated is actually the fact that we are over-reliant and over-dependent mm. on the outside world. And that yeah. makes us as a continent very vulnerable. Mm. And it is not because we don't have the resources. We do have. And the reality is that every time African scientists, for instance, were challenged and given the resources, they rose to the occasion. And if there's anything to go by, you will see how, for instance, scientists across the continent, mm. you know, use the tool of genomics to help not only the continent, but also the world. Mm -hmm. So which means that we do have the ability, but unfortunately, this is not being used or exploited. And these catalytic successes, the few we saw uh, strong collaboration between science, scientists <clears throat> and National Public Health Institute and African Public Health Institute and Africa CDC helping the continent in many ways. But that has not translated into things, products like, you know, vaccine diagnostic therapeutics. And the reason is simple. And it is, the, I mean, the reason is simple. We don't just, we need to look beyond COVID and then really start putting some things in place. Mm. And that has to do with, you know, and everything that we want to translate this research into diagnostic dimension, therapeutics and vaccine. Yes, mm. we can do it. <clears throat> Africa has to look inward and at the same time leverage its very rich diaspora and bring all of its daughters and sons and think about how they want to move and cut this dependence of the continent 
and move the continent in a different direction. We should be the drivers of public health intervention measures development. We should be the drivers of developing countermeasures. But for us to do that, we must have the political will. As a continent, we should, I mean, we should invest in a very sustainable way in research and development. And this has to be done by governments, by regional funders, and the private sectors and then philanthropies. We've seen a lot of philanthropies in Africa that really do not donate to the continent, but donate outside the continent a lot. We need to find a way to convince and bring everybody around the table and let them realize that our common future is mm -hmm. very dependent on how much we support R&D on the continent. Mm -hmm. We need to support the emergence of local you know, biotechnologies because the future of medicine, be it vaccine development, diagnostic development, and therapeutics, is very dependent on biotechnology. And we don't have it. Chico mentioned, yes, we also need to train a well-skilled workforce. We need to have our university rethink our programs, you know, so that we can think about the science of the future, our opposition, you know, science in a way that we can use a knowledge gain and learn in school to develop these new novel technologies. But then we need to build an ecosystem. So that is the political and the academic ecosystem on the continent should leverage you know, the diverse resources available on the continent, but also to its diaspora. We have a lot to offer, but we are not looking at ourselves, but we rather want to be very dependent and then wait for what the world will do for us. Ultimately, I think, you know, I've laid on some of these things, but what ultimately I just have to say is that the continent and Africa must realize that the, our future and our economic growth is inextricably linked to research and development on the continent. And when I talk about research and development, I'm not talking not just about science, I'm talking about on all area, health systems and everything, to do, come up with solutions and, and to solutions that are peculiar and very specific to the continent. You know, and this plan, I mean, some of these ideas that I'm talking about, I believe should be, you know, um, backed by national government, yeah. Pan-African political health organizations, and every other thing, that, I mean, and all African sons and daughters. Okay. And that's the only way we will, as a continent, survive and eventually lead the world because we have the capability to do that. Thank you. Right. No, thank you. Thank you very much. I think all of you have converged in this need for a solid ecosystem, uh, uh, which we greatly appreciate. Stephen, over to you. Three minutes, please. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Loisius, and uh, good morning and good, good afternoon and evening for my fellow panelists. Um, I think what COVID has done actually is to <laughs> expose how important the economics of health uh, is. Uh, the piece that uh, Vera has contributed in Foresight uh, for Foresight Africa for this year does actually talk to, 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 to these issues of um, economics of health because we can do everything we want to do in terms of um, transforming the African continent, but if then you have um, sick people, um, or if you have people who cannot meet uh, the expenditure requirements for them to deal with um, diseases or even pandemics, then everything that you have built uh, falls down. So some of the work that has been done here at the ECA, and this is work that was done um, a year or two before the pandemic. We did a report called the Health and Economic Growth Report on Africa. And one of the things that came out of that report was how huge is the share of out-of-pocket expenditures for families when it comes to dealing with issues of health. And so you have heard people say that many African families are basically one sickness away to fall below the poverty line. Now, why this situation is dire is because as we speak today, uh, if you look at the share of um, uh, communicable diseases, uh, in terms of the disease burden for Africa. It's about 60% and about uh, just under 40% for the non-communicable diseases as we speak today. Now, the problem is this, this ratio is changing so rapidly towards what we see in the rest of the world. And before we know it, the share of the non-communicable diseases in Africa in terms of the disease burden is going to be very high and if we do not do anything in terms of building um, health systems that can actually be able to deal with this, including the research 
uh, that has been talked about by my, my uh, the other panelists, we would find ourselves in a very serious situation now, so, so, so I think that point is very important when we think about the future of the continent. Now, so, uh, the other thing that the issue has been doing uh, now is to, especially with the, within the context of um, COVID-19, is to contribute to the efforts of the scientists and the leaders in terms of building institutions. Mm -hmm. I think um, one of the things that comes out of the, this pandemic is the legacy institutions that are going to remain with this, within this continent, mm -hmm. the African Medical Supplies Platform, the AVAT, the Norfolk Compensation, uh, when dealing with um, new, new drugs or new vaccines. I mm -hmm. think these are things that um, we should celebrate and they are going to be part and parcel of building a resilient health system uh, in, the, in, the, in the continent. So for now, I think I would, uh, I would leave it there. Thank you. Yeah. Stephen, thank you. Thank you very much to all of you. Let's now turn to specific um, questions to panel members. Let me start with you, uh, uh, Mohammed. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset, we're very grateful to you for the excellent framing essay that you, you've, you provided in Foresight Africa 2022. Um, how should our countries on the continent solve the problem of extreme dependence on the global north, which all of you have touched upon uh, one way or the other in your remarks, especially as regards supplies of diagnostics, medicines, and vaccines. So I think the predominant, let's say the dominant paradigm in global development has been one that looks at Africa as a place of extraction uh, that has also been, uh, I would say, largely transactional relative to the continent, as opposed to thinking transformationally. So many of the efforts uh, for the last 20 years, you've got huge investments in health, but there's a lot of that is focused on intervention, specific interventions. And the systems that my other co-panelists have sort of talked about, the ecosystem really requires a transformational thinking to build it over time and over a longer time, not three year cycles or five year cycles of development assistance. And I think the, framing that has emerged from that paradigm has been one that has been unhelpful because it sort of divides the issue between African recipients and donors and investors on the other side. And as a consequence, it allowed, let's say, uh, leaders in the continent to somehow escape from the responsibility they have to invest in their health systems in the first place, uh, to be held accountable by uh, their citizens which uh, uh, Christian also sort of alluded to, uh, that there are certain things that it's leaders on the continent that ought to be able to invest. When you have a country and you spend just a few dollars per person, or you don't mobilize enough resources uh, from your economy because of all kinds of reasons, governance, corruption, and all of that, you don't have much to invest. And the responsibility is not global, it's national. And those difficult choices have to be made by leaders on the continent itself then they can be able to engage and work transformationally. So particularly when you talk about commodities, whether it's test kits, my God, even masks, when the pandemic emerged, we had to import them from outside the continent. This is textile, we grow cotton, but we have to, we are complaining that we are not able to get masks. So to think about those commodities and manufacture them locally, not COVID vaccines, my God, even paracetamol, ampicillin, simple antibiotics, uh, I think we need to do a lot more in that. But how do we do that? It will require what uh, Tolu mentioned in terms of public policies, in terms of regulatory uh, standards. How many of our regulatory entities are actually level three that are very capable on the continent? Very few. And those are difficult things that governments ought to be able to do themselves, not someone to do for us. The research and development, how much do we expend in research and development and the STEM education that Christian alluded to? This is what government should be doing, not thinking about begging for vaccines from the rest of the world. And then the private sector itself has brought the brunt of the pandemic. They saw billions of dollars <laughs> really vanishing. So organizing the private sector, uh, organizing the financing from the private sector, private sector is an interest to invest in the talent. It's also key. And the research and development itself contributing in a very intentional way, Moderna, and BioNTech, all the innovations that we have seen, most of them, they had public subsidies from the North 
no doubt about it. And those played an important role. But they also raised all the sources of, of capital and largely uh, private entities that collaborated with their governments. So on the continent, doing that will be key. And then the framework that the regional institutions have begun to uh, put together, the African Union, Africa CDC, ECA, that's an important enabler for the transformation of the continent to actualize the vision of Africa 2063. If we're really serious about it, that will require leadership that is thinking transformationally, not just transactionally, that is playing into the hands of a paradigm at the global level, that is looking at Africa as a transactional uh, place, a place where you extract resources, natural resources, and human resources. Thank you very much. Indeed, uh, uh, Mohammed, the points you, you made were echoed in an earlier panel we had last, actually earlier this month, uh, uh, when Dr. Deji Soji, whom you know very, very well, and a few others um, came on our platform to discuss his new book. It was quite clear that this need to hold our own leaders accountable for even spending on, on malaria, on malaria. You know, the, the, the team argued very vehemently that um, these are some of the things we ought to be doing ourselves. So thank you, thank you very much. Let me turn to Chikwe. It has been interesting to follow Germany's support to the WHO to set up the new hub for pandemic and epidemic intelligence in Berlin, which you now lead. Yet, we all witnessed the world's response to South Africa when they shared their initial findings regarding the Omicron variant. How do you intend to achieve the lofty objectives of sharing of intelligence in the context of the real politic that we all watched as it played out recently? <laughs> Aloysius, thank you. That's uh, obviously a very tough question because um, of course, emotionally, I was completely 100% on the side of South Africa and felt their pain um, when the world reacted the way it did uh, just after that. But, um, you know, policy and long-term change should not be driven by knee-jerk reactions to single incidents um, that happen over a, a period. Um, I, I think the less, one of the biggest lessons from this pandemic is whether you look north or south, east or west, all our leaders, political leaders, have struggled with making big decisions around how to respond. And, and some countries that were held up as having responded brilliantly in the first six months of the outbreak, 12 months down the line, we are all challenging that paradigm. Two years down the line, some of the countries right now in Asia that we thought, gosh, you know, they, they manage this very well. Suddenly, the country with the highest number of uh, pressure on their hospital services, as we speak today, well, we can't call it a country anymore, Hong Kong, is, is, a, is someone that was held up as a paradigm of an excellent response a few uh, months ago. So why do I say this? Um, never before have we, this pandemic has demonstrated how dependent we are on each other. You know, the Ebola outbreak, as big as it was, and as much as it cost the global economy, we could still pack it mentally in the mental space of something that happens in one part of the world. Um, but now we have seen how important uh, it is for our own mutual existence uh, to share. Now, to do this well also means that we have to change our systems, right? And work not with the traditional paradigms of giving people uh, forms to fill it in a way that we want them to fill and we assume that a hundred and uh, whatever number of countries in the world will fill that form in exactly the same way because we're telling them to do so. The, the fact is that the world has moved on and the, no one has that level of authority. So what we're now trying to do is the, this, we, we accept the complexities of data flows, we accept the complexities of uh, systems, but let's find a way that flows a little bit below the political radar and mm. through the technical collaboration of expertise mm. that wants to provide our leaders 
the best possible opportunity of making the right decisions. Ultimately, mm-hmm. we cannot, and we, we, they, will, they will still take the decisions that they will take, right? Mm-hmm. They will still be influenced by other sources, politics, security, a sense of national interest, whatever that is. But our, we cannot, that, their, that's their responsibility. They are political leaders. Our responsibility as public health people, scientists, is to enable them the best possible opportunity to mm. make better decisions. And, and this is not a short game. It's not something we hope to achieve in a few months. It's mm. also not an extractive game. If, if, if we are perceived as something in Berlin that is set up to suck data out of countries and mm. then make the decisions and give them back the decision that they will make, you know, we have lost from the beginning. So we want to build a truly global collaborative among experts to enable us to feel a sense of agency as we, <clears throat> we help our leaders. And I say this from a point of view of having been in that situation for two very intense years, where every week I had to offer our political leadership the basis on which to close borders, to open borders, to shut down states in Nigeria, and so this is not a theoretical reality. This is a hard lesson that we've learned. And one, I hope that through our collective wisdom, uh, we can move towards uh, solving. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Let me turn to you, Christian. Um, your excellent viewpoint in this year's foresight clearly shows, and your earlier remarks as well, that you're very much at the epicenter of science, research, and development. Indeed, your center generated the first sequence of COVID-19 in Africa within 72 hours of receiving the sample, which is a remarkable accomplishment. What is your relationship with Africa-based manufacturers of pharmaceuticals and vaccines? Uh, thank you, Aloysius. I, again, um, really just want to also uh, mention that that great fit of, you know, sequencing the genome for the uh, 72 hours was a very fantastic collaboration between my lab, then uh, Chikwe at the Center for Disease, National Nigeria Center for Disease Control, uh, Nimer, and then uh, the Lagos State Ministry of Health, you know, and then that really you could see how collaboration is well done, can be very powerful. So, and in, in this saying, it's, of course, we are the center, but that really collaboration with the manufacturing sector doesn't exist. You know, we have a very good collaboration with the public health institutions across the continent, with Africa CDC, Nigeria Center for and other, you know, public health institutes. And I think that, you know, the, maybe the private sector, the government should learn from public health institutes you know, to see how powerful collaboration could be. During this pandemic, for instance, we've helped sequence, you know, uh, as COVID-19 sample from about 32 African countries. And then this is collaboratively with public health institutions. We've helped train, you know, over 80 something uh, scientists across the continent from different places, from Somalia to, you know, I mean, we're talking about countries that are challenged by wars and others. But then you don't see the same kind of collaboration with, you know, the, we're talking about the, the manufacturing or the private sector. But then one of the reasons why you don't see this is actually that in real sense, when you look at it, it does not exist. And we need to spend some time and invest in this area. You know, when you, when you talk about drug manufacturing on the continent, I've always said this. I said, look, show me a vaccine or a, what a real pharmaceutical company in Africa that has a very strong R&D department, non-existing. What we're doing basically is packaging. And we need to change that ways of doing business by really you know, working with scientists, bringing scientists into the pharma, in the, in the pharma industry, and then leveraging the African, you know, what, I, what I call the, 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 the pharmacopoeia. We, there's a lot we can offer, but unfortunately we are really not investing in the right direction. So, and then that interface is very important. Academia will produce what they can produce, but at some point, that knowledge has to spin off and then got into the sector that can actually take it to a different level, whereby we're talking about manufacturing and eventually mass producing and then making making things available and adaptable for the continent. 
We are not seeing it. And it's simply, it's simply because most of those infrastructures or most of these companies, you know, do not exist. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Stephen, let me turn to you for the moment. Given the experience we've had with COVID-19, uh, much is being said now about the need for more self-reliance uh, in Africa's health sector. What is UNECA's contribution to this aspiration? No, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I, I touched on some of the things that you've been doing, but let me mention one thing that um, we call it. So we have the African continent of free trade area. I think mm -hmm. you have heard, all of you have heard about it. Um, we've done a bit of work on the AFCFTA. Uh, we've asked us, we've looked at what are the sectors that are likely to benefit most from the AFCFTA. And it turns out that, for instance, pharmaceuticals is going to be one of the uh, sectors among the top 10 that would benefit from opening up the trade uh, in the, under the AFCFTA. Now, the interesting thing is that the, that's the industrial part. Now, the, the, there is also the, the market part. Uh, so we have the, the intellectual property rights conversations that are going to take place under the AFCFTA competition policy and also investment uh, policies now. All these are going to be very instrumental to the realization of the pharma, for instance, initiative uh, of the pharma, the, the pharma industry. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because we have an initiative that is ongoing called the AFCFTA Anchored Pharma Initiative. And this pharmaceutical initiative has three pillars, uh, scaling up local pharmaceutical uh, manufacturing, uh, pooled procurement in terms of uh, creating demand uh, for whatever is manufactured. And the third the pillar is on um, regulations and um, you know, the regulatory regime. Now, the, what ECA uh, is trying to do with this initiative is first of all to demonstrate um, the, the proof of concept for the AFGFTA in terms of answering the issues that has been mentioned in this panel when it comes to health issue, are we manufacturing enough? So as we speak, in fact, we have identified um, through an expression of interest, two pharma companies uh, within the continent, one based in Kenya, one based in Senegal. And what we plan to do, what we are doing with them is basically to, to, to provide uh, support to them so that they can go beyond, um, you know, they can take uh, advantage of the continental market in terms of what they are going to produce, be able to attract finance to, to grow their balance sheet. And we, 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 we believe that um, this will help them increase the portfolio of the products that they produce, which of course will be part of building the resilience uh, that we would want to see in terms of our, ability, our regional supply chains for health, uh, for health sector needs. And so this is something concrete that we are trying to do. The cool thing is that the principles that were underpinning this initiative, which mm. we started as far back as 2019, became very useful mm. when it was time to talk about pool procurement under the AMSP, yes. uh, local yes. manufacturing of PPEs under the, for, for supply to the AM, through the AMSP. And of course, all the conversations that are taking place now Mm. under the Pan-African Vaccine Manufacturing Initiative that Africa CDC is leading, right. where the market design and demand intelligence is one of the pillars. All these mm. issues each year had addressed through the Pharma Initiative, and we believe we are contributing towards this uh, resilience. So that's a concrete example mm. of what it is that we are doing. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm actually amazed how since the pandemic was announced, ECA has convened in, a, a, in partnership with other African institutions, every Wednesday morning, religiously, you know, opinion shapers and key leaders in the industry uh, from across the continent. I must admit, you guys, uh, thank you very much for, for, for all the work you're doing in that area. So let me turn to you. Um, as you know very well, the AU adopted the pharmaceutical manufacturing plan for Africa in 2007. Uh, yet today, as you also mentioned in your, in your viewpoint, the continent produces much, much less than 1% of our vaccines. Could you explain why locally produced vaccines remain so low 
and what's been done to address this problem? Yes, I, I can. So I think the first thing we should do is, first of all, understand why there's been a gap. You know, we talked about the Africa Manufacturing Plan being developed uh, way back in 2007. And to date, we still have this 1% uh, local vaccine production statistic. And I think the, the fact is that we, we have a challenge, a systematic challenge or, or a systemic challenge in Africa where we have the plan, you know, we have the policy, we have the framework, but we struggle to actually implement it. And I think that was a, a key challenge um, in, in terms of translating that manufacturing plan to uh, actual tangible deliverables. I think part of the challenge as well was that we really were not integrating the plan into the economic development of the continent, right? Because there's a clear tie with manufacturing and industrial development, and that link was missing in, in the political will um, and in the economic plan. And so compounding uh, this issue of implementation or the policy versus the implementation, I think the reality is that you, you know we have very serious challenges um, that we're grappling with on the on the continent. I think vaccine manufacturing is an expensive endeavor. We can't uh, hide that fact. Depending on the dosage uh, and and um, the level of the facility, you're looking at anything from fifty million dollars to two hundred million dollars. And it's not that the funds are not there, but it's more about the organization of of and the collaboration and the commitment to actually uh, securing the investments. Um, so I think you know government um, really had to had a stake in that and wasn't really realizing it. Um, but but the the good thing you know is that the COVID-19 pandemic has always has been a blessing in disguise in that we've seen you know rapid um, progression in regulatory, mm -hmm. in expansion of vaccine development, in um, uh, scale up, uh, et cetera, which we hadn't seen in the last 20 years. So in the last few years, there's been a, a lot of progression. Uh, innovation is reducing the cost of vaccine production. Mm -hmm. um, the skills gap that was also a challenge is being addressed uh, with um, uh, tran uh, tech, tech transfer hubs and uh, we're very happy that that was established the global hub was established by WHO and partners in South Africa uh, mm -hmm. and of course um, you know the highest level of governance right at Africa CDC level at African Union level and even uh, select heads of states level uh, mm -hmm. actually seen uh, vaccine manufacturing at the at the highest levels of the agenda. So I think that's that's the gap, and that's uh, um, what we're doing to address this one percent. Um, but I, I will just close by saying that you know we're really scratching the surface right now. We, there's so much that needs to be done. Mm. If we're looking at one percent today. Uh, and we want to achieve the next milestone, which is 10% by 2025. We're talking about tenfold difference, you know, mm. tenfold fold scale. Um, and that would require a, an, an unprecedented amount of collaboration. And, mm. you know, I think when, I, when we see that, um, you know, all heads of states, uh, when we see, you know, you know billions, not just uh, um, couple bi the couple, but unprecedented amounts of funding, then we can say that we're really on the path of, of uh, uh, moving from foreign dependency to local vaccine uh, development yeah. and production. Right, thank you, thank you very much. Let me turn to you, Mohammed. Um, until recently, of course, before your move to Harvard, you were the uh, uh, senior director for global practice uh, in health in the World Bank. Uh, could you share with us three lessons uh, that you learned in that role and how those are now relevant to the future of health in Africa? Well, thank you. Um, and let me underline just something uh, that uh, Christian mentioned. The idea of global Africa, I think is something that we should take away from this panel. Uh, think about Africa and the diaspora and how that could uh, help us as we move forward. 
So on the World Bank and my two-year experience, I have to say it's been a great honor for me to have served in that role leading the health practice and to work with so many excellent colleagues, exceptional colleagues uh, all over the world, all regions, uh, through the pandemic period itself. Really a great honor. And I saw the tremendous potential of what good the World Bank as an institution can make. I have three or four lessons which you've asked me to think about. One is on multilateralism itself, an excellent idea that the world solely needs. And in the pandemic, the bank, uh, within a very short period of time, was able to mobilize $6 billion by early March, put more than uh, 100 countries, put money in their hands. So less talk, but a lot of focus on delivery at the country level. And that was within a package of $150 billion that the bank announced for over 15 months, uh, an important contribution in terms of response to the pandemic. But that wasn't enough. The multilateral system, despite it being a great idea, has very shaky foundation. Uh, a shaky foundation and the global system itself has profound problems. As my friend, my brother at the WHO and other UN agencies will admit, not only in the context of COVID-19, but what we're seeing right now in Europe. So I think uh, the fragility of the multilateral system became very evident to me. While the bank and my colleagues and others really played an incredible role in terms of helping countries, but they couldn't solve the problems by themselves. The world order itself was on a bit of a shaky foundation. And I think this opportunity that we have now to rethink that and the role of regional institutions, like what we've seen in the Africa region, it's become more, more, more at more to the center uh, because I don't think uh, we'll have the kind of multilateralism that we had in the pre-independence era of African countries or in the immediate post-independence era and to rethink the role of regional institutions. Secondly, prevention is far less attractive than cure, than response. And I'll give you a few examples. In September, 2019, I met with six African ministers uh, in New York on the UN and was trying to convince them to improve their preparedness around DRC Ebola. They had Ebola in the neighborhood and to actually ask them to stand up their preparations, the surveillance and all of that. I was very struck that they are all arguing for free resources, not thinking about domestic mobilization. And that was in September, 2019. I wouldn't mention the countries, but when in the bank itself in December, 2019, we had uh, my colleagues, uh, Lukesh Chawla and I uh, really developed a concept for pandemic preparedness uh, to raise a billion dollars and an MPA. We circulated it, we struggled. We didn't know that COVID was going to hit a few weeks later. Absolutely clueless, but we are sort of helping to shape that agenda. And there wasn't really much uptake, neither in terms of uh, other colleagues outside the health sector, but also in terms of country clients. Other finance ministers had other priorities. In other words, um, when the pandemic hit a couple of weeks later, we had $6 billion and we had $80, $12 billion. So prevention doesn't make heroes, but early response, that's where everybody really gets to uh, be a hero in terms of mobilizing resources. And the money came. We saw $22 trillion being uh, deployed in responding to a pandemic when what we could have prevented, we did not prevent. And that's something that very really much uh, struck me. The third one is that the global investments in health over the last 20 years, remarkable amounts of resources pumped in countries in Africa and many other developing countries. But yet we're still saying the systems are weak, are fragile. If you look deeply in COVID, oxygen, for instance, was a huge issue. When you have these surges, whether it's Johannesburg in Nairobi or Lagos or Dakar, uh, our hospitals didn't have the reticulation to really provide oxygen. Yet we have huge amounts of pneumonias that require oxygen on a daily basis. And when I asked a professor of virology in one of the major universities on the continent, uh, what is our viral surveillance like? Maybe Christian will answer that in uh, uh, She said to me, look, we only have surveillance system for two viruses, respiratory viruses that are of the interest of donors. And this is COVID-19 and HIV in terms of the systematic surveillance because they are funded by the donors. So in a way, we are blind in terms of the huge issue of viral pneumonias and their contribution, whether it's RSV, whether it's human metaneuromaviruses or other kinds of viruses. And so the investments in the global health space have been focused on global priorities that are sometimes overlap with local priorities, but are not always in sync. Things like sickle cell disease and African disease, 
but it's not a global disease. It doesn't have as much of the priority as it requires. And many of the issues that we're dealing with in terms of backlog of maternal, newborn, child health, adolescent health, food systems, hygiene, um, they're not really as much global, but then African policymakers have oriented their mindset to the supranational influences in terms of their policies. And I think that's something that really struck me because the passive recipient role became very convenient uh, to play. And the final one, which is um, one that I also uh, observed, was that despite this uh, track record of HIV, Zika, SARS, uh, Ebola, the global public good space was really not ready for a huge pandemic regardless of the rhetoric that existed. Uh, with the surge mechanism, I mentioned how IDA stepped in, fast response, 100 countries within uh, 100 days. Um, but I have to say that wasn't, it wasn't really necessarily adequate, as we've seen with vaccines, particularly on the delivery side. Um, the supply chains really became dysfunctional. You recall by March, by February, uh, masks were really nowhere to be found in many places. People had to sue their local masks. Ventilators were all cornered by countries. At the global level, there wasn't a, an organized supply chain network or system. You've got the union agencies, WHO, UNICEF, and others uh, trying their bit. But as a global community, uh, the firms were out on their own. Uh, we saw masks going to 20 folds price increase. Uh, and all kinds of issues that wasn't really organized. So in terms of global public goods and services, I think there was a major gap, yet we had had several notices, not only the expectation of influenza, but Ebola, then previous coronaviruses, and then this coronavirus. So I hope some of these lessons um, would be inform the shape of the global architecture going forward, but also a wake up call for regional entities and national leaders in terms of what they need to do to prevent, but also to respond quickly. Because pandemic don't become pandemics uh, overnight. They start from a small outbreak, which grows into an epidemic before it goes into pandemic. So the global construct of a pandemic, it's really to some extent can be an illusion. It's, sort of a, it's too late in the game. And I hope that uh, whether it's climate change, whether it's war, whether it's infectious diseases, uh, the world will learn the right lessons and think about multilateralism as an instrument, but rectify its foundations so that it's real rather than sets of global agendas negotiated by countries where the powerful have their way and the weakest basically are left to follow or do as they are told. Those are, those are remarkable lessons indeed. Thank you very much, Mohammed. <clears throat> Let me turn to Chikwe because your viewpoint in um, uh, last year's uh, Foresight Africa is on record as the most downloaded piece to date, for which we're very, very grateful to you. Uh, just along the lines, I just asked Mohammed earlier on, and indeed you alluded to some of this in your earlier remark. What do you take away? as the three biggest lessons you learned in your tenure as Director General of the Nigeria CDC. Thanks, Aloysius. I'll make your life easier and I'll, I'll keep it to one, <laughs> <laughs> one lesson. But I, I really want to build on what my big brother Mohammed said, because it is in that passive recipient role that our biggest downfall is. If we leave this session, with a determination to challenge that paradigm, it would have made this much more than what it's worth. Because not only, like Mohammed said earlier, that we are allowing our governments escape the responsibility of investing in our own health sector. But even when they give us, we beg inefficiently and without shame. And so there, it leads to a, an incredible alignment of um, terrible incentives. So imagine if we wanted to, imagine if we wanted to support Ukraine. Let me take a very concrete example in their defense. And we said, listen, we are not, we don't trust the Ukrainian army, actually. We're, we're, we want to support Ukraine, but we are going to send in our private army, right? And we are going to only send it into the Northeast 
because it is in that Northeast that I, the donor, have perceived that the problem of Ukraine is. And, and the, the, the government of Ukraine is too inefficient. So I can't trust them with procurement. I can't trust them with, so I will buy the things that you will use to, this is how we deal with global health. You know, we use, um, PEFA has implementing partners. Uh, <laughs> the Global Fund has primary recipients, secondary recipients. Gavi only implements through WHO and UNICEF. So where are the national institutions with the responsibility of doing those things that we in the global north now, I'm part of that architecture, I wouldn't lie, but I am here because we've got to change it. The, the institutions responsible for what we want to do, for if we really want that to work, we have to strengthen the institute. If we say, listen, they, those, that institution is too corrupt or too inefficient, therefore we will circumvent it. We will never have sustainable uh, engagement. So I think, yes, I agree that we have to aim towards self-sufficiency in public health and all the health uh, sector responses. But in the short term, while there are still available resources to support our development, and you can argue, rightly so, that <laughs> this is not charity. There is some responsibility uh, globally. But we have to improve the efficiency in that. And to do that, there needs to be a push factor. So the, the guys supporting countries that need us have to say, listen, we will do this, but we will do this through your own institutions. But there also has to be a pull factor. So the ministers, our ministers have to also insist, listen, if you want to support my HIV program, support my institution that is responsible for delivering on that program. And don't give it to six <laughs> uh, projects from your universities, your institutions, your industry to come and do for me here. That, that is not development. So I, I think I, I want to push this paradigm. But all of us have a space if we use our voices and the organizations that we work in to not only change an attitude in the global north, but also change uh, the way we lead and pull in from uh, the countries that we belong to is loud and clear this day. <clears throat> Let me turn to Christian because um, part of the responses from various colleagues on the panel is on this importance of the regulatory framework for us to succeed on the African continent. From your perspective, what's really, really being done uh, on the regulatory front to address the problem we face? Um, <clears throat> I do hope that, you know, that uh, Africa as a continent and then the countries could build mm. the regulatory agencies so that they can absolutely um, uh, be at the level whereby they can uh, do regulation with confidence. I do think that where we're lacking and where we're falling short is simply, be, I mean, due to the fact that, you know, our regulatory bodies are very weak. And then they are not, you know, operating at the level where they're supposed to be. But we also our regulatory bodies are also very dependent. I mean, it's still very puzzling to me that you know a product to be used in Africa in many places, you know, still require FDA approval, or if we still require, you know, approval by certain, I mean, um, in international regulatory bodies. And I wonder what are the African regulatory bodies doing? Do Africa at this point, you know, like uh, 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 Professor Pate mentioned, you mm -hmm. know, that we have regional organizations that have proven, you know, their work and improved that they can do very well with the interests of a continent at stake. So the mm -hmm. question is, can we gravitate toward setting up, um, I mean, African regulatory bodies that are as efficient as possible and that can do actually take regulations and then do it for the continent than to be waiting for product to be regulated elsewhere for the continent. And then that's mm. exactly again where we see that over dependence and then the fact that we really are not free to do what we want. And we need to, mm. I mean, we need to start moving toward mm. that uh, the level whereby the regulations of the African continent, you know, supersede mm. whatever is coming from our side. Mm. And I think there's a lot to build there. And again, uh, as I mentioned before, 
It's not because we don't have the resources or the human resources in, 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 in inside the continent or, mm. or outside the continent. They exist. Can we leverage them? Can we really just set ourselves up and say that this is exactly where we want to go and then mm. look inward and outside and bring all of the, 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 the children of Africa together and say mm. this is exactly where we're going with the continental framework. We are talking about the, 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 the African um, uh, uh, continental trade frame, I mean, uh, 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 I mean uh, 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 this whole big program that is coming up. Hmm. If that is the way we want to go, why can't we just go along with every other thing so that everything falls in place? We cannot be having a framework that is actually boost, I mean, supposed to be boost, you know, hmm. trading across the continent, and we don't have a regulatory body that actually can leverage what, that, and we keep having this fragmented. So I think we need to really set up, and I mean, again, it is an ecosystem. We need to start building that ecosystem and we need to take truth. I mean, tell, tell ourselves the truth. The truth mm. is, yes, we are all individually doing this, but I don't think that we have sat down as a continent and told ourselves the truth. And that truth is we need to start looking inward and we need to mm. start thinking as a people that want to mm. take their destiny, destiny at hand and mm. then, you know, and then run with it. Mm. Thank you. No, no, thank you very much. News just in, in the recent uh, uh, weeks is that BioNTech, the German... Um, a manufacturer of vaccine recently announced that to boost capacity across the world, it is converting shipping containers into vaccine factories. In fact, they are already in, in discussions apparently with South Africa, with Rwanda and with Senegal as possible location for the, these activities. What do you see as the opportunities and challenges of doing this? at this time. Uh, Tolu, may I start with you? So first of all, I would say, I would say it's a welcome development with caveats. I think it's welcome mm -hmm. because it's important to have different uh, solutions in our toolbox, mm -hmm. right? So uh, building uh, greenfield uh, manufacturing plants is, is important expanding mm. existing capabilities where we have a uh, local vaccine manufacturing mm. in the five countries that are well established is also important. Mm. Uh, having these container solutions, which appear to be modular, um, and they're easy to ship uh, and they can really um, be deployed in a quick manner is important. Mm. But I think the, the missing piece really is, is the fact that they were not developed with African scientists and, and African technicians uh, in mind. So they were really developed for mm. Global North, right? And so we're not getting a tailored containerized solution. Mm. We're getting mm. a, a box that we're trying to force fit into the environment where you have infrastructural challenges, you know, power, water, um, where you have to uh, figure out how the logistics around deploying them. And then mm. where you also have to, to train, uh, you know, the human capacity that would actually man uh, uh, these um, containers and, and uh, use them. So I think, you know, the, the missing piece is, is having African input uh, mm. from the uh, concept phase to the to the design phase to the manufacturing of these shipping containers, mm. um, and and I think you know BioNTech is not was not the first manufacturer to actually put together container solutions. He had uh, other companies like Cytiva, uh, mm. a former um, G Life Sciences uh, offshoot uh, business. So this is something that has been uh, in the works for a while, but again. Mm. Um, it's it's not fully incorporating the realities that we face on the African continent. Mm. Um, and the last piece of, of this would be the sustainability. So again, uh, how, how is it going to be operated? How is it going to be maintained if we are not putting those mechanisms in place uh, and, and having Africans engage uh, in that process and, and training them to actually uh, man these container solutions. So there are a lot of complementary solutions in, in a nutshell that would really need to be put in place to make this uh, an effective solution. Mm. Uh, I think the, the scale up is also going to be uh, important, um, but I mean, I, I would welcome it. it. It's just not a complete 
uh, solution it needs complementary solutions and yeah. it needs uh, African uh, human and uh, uh, technical input from the get go. Great, thank you very much. Mohammed, any thoughts on this same question? I, I think it's a long game. Uh, I think uh, Chico had mentioned, I think it will take time. Uh, transfer of technology is key, uh, but at the same time, we need to invest in the long run in terms of the talent, in terms of R&D, in terms of the IP, in terms of the regulatory. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done over time, uh, mm. not just short term uh, immediate responses, which may be relevant for now. Mm. But we've got several other issues, uh, whether malaria vaccines will be manufactured on the continent, uh, which other vaccines that are relevant to the people of Africa that can mm. be manufactured on the continent or non-communicable diseases mm. whose remedies will need to be. We don't produce biologics, for instance, which mm. are necessary for cancers, for other diseases on the continent. Sickle yeah. cell disease, similar uh, efforts would be needed. So I think it's a big agenda that will take time, but it starts with leadership, commitment of Africans and friends of Africa. When I say Africa, I mean global Africa, including the diaspora and the friends of Africa uh, to really help Africa reposition itself in the global community. Thank you. Let me, uh, may I say word yes, that? please do. One, one second. You know, I, I, just to add, I, I'm also, I don't know enough about this to have a strong opinion, but okay. um, w one point I just want to add, uh, an, an anecdote from my uh, time at NCDC is we have a very well-equipped mobile lab packed in front of NCDC. Throughout our five years, I was never really able to deploy that lab. Because when people think about this solution, you, you, you imagine that it's easy to <laughs> deploy something like that. But it's an ecosystem. A lab has to function with the supply chain, reagent supply, people. Even if you take that lab somewhere, you, know, you have to supply electricity. You have to, the people that will work in that lab have to be in hotels. So, you know, there are really no simple solutions uh, to this. This is an anecdote from my own space. I'm not sure how transferable it is uh, to the uh, vaccine development space. But from my own space, I'd much rather work with someone like Professor Happy, who is developing an ecosystem that includes development, training, everything in a center, mm -hmm. and then yeah. pay for transportation of my samples from uh, Imo State to Osho State, where his lab is, rather yeah. than take a mobile lab to Osho State to solve a problem uh, without the ecosystem required around it to enable it deliver a yeah. yeah. With so, the caveat, this yeah. might not be transferable to the vaccine space. This is one anecdote that might help us contextualize uh, these new offers that we're getting on our continent. So interventions versus systems, I think Chikwe, that's what you're saying. Yeah, uh, the mobile container is an intervention, and you can look at Africa as that. But the building system is what Christian and yourself are saying that is needed over the long term. Yeah, absolutely. By implication, Christian, you've been uh, uh, compromised by a couple of speakers. Do you have a view on this? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I don't think that my my other co panelists actually said it all. I don't think okay. I have anything else to add. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. Let me now turn to um, uh, our patient audience. Um, uh, um, there is a question from Miss Juliet Twakley. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. She's the chair and board of trustees of United Way Worldwide. She asks, what examples are there of effective domestic financing systems that can be implemented in African countries for public health needs. Perhaps we should start with uh, uh, Brother Stephen. Your thoughts. <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> okay. I think this one we should have left it to Chikwe, huh? <laughs> people who have been working in the in the public policy space. Uh, I was going to say the following: at least for us as the Economic Commission for Africa. We are not um, a, a financing institution, but there's one thing that we believe in, that you actually can finance through savings uh, by making things um, of high quality that are affordable. So the agenda that we are having about um, pooled procurement, 
what it is doing is actually to make it possible for small economies, uh, say an economy like Seychelles or Mauritius, or a small country like Mauritius, to be able to access um, medical needs at the same price as a big economy like Ethiopia or a big country like South Africa. So through, through that kind of innovation of um, pooling procurement, and then having that demand being channeled to local manufacturers within the continent, we will actually be responding to the needs for the continent to be able to bring down the costs of, um, of financing. Uh, because the, 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 the expenditures on health are very high. The countries cannot actually meet through their budgets the expenditures that are required for them to be able uh, to meet all the health needs. So one of the things that we are, we are advocating is that issue of quality, uh, affordability, and, and access uh, through these innovative financing mechanisms. Very much. One of the things that hasn't come up in all this conversation is the famous Abuja Declaration of 2001 that uh, you know, where countries announced basically across the continent of spending 15% of their budget on the health sector. I just wonder- Deliberately so, Aloysius. <laughs> I have actually uh, avoided that because for every sector, there yes. is a similar, a similar proportion, right. a similar declaration if you go yes. to agriculture and everything, even in our R&D. Yeah. And we know we have um, sort of a finite um, budget uh, budget uh, quantum. So yes. the minute you start allocating this, it becomes very difficult. And that right. is why the private sector yes. is critical to this financing of health within right. the continent. Okay. Uh, Mohammed, as uh, pu putting on your hat now as former Minister of Health in Nigeria, what's your thought on this? <laughs> no, I, I, I was just uh, smiling because you could ask the same question on the 0.7% GDP as well. How many countries actually uh, raised uh, <laughs> went up to that? Right. So there are many examples of good uh, uh, health financing practices, I would say. Yeah. Uh, and they are sort of the commonality is sort of locally uh, oriented, citizen oriented, strong leadership and capable institutions, whether it's Rwanda, whether it's in Ghana, whether it's in some states in Nigeria. Uh, you have the state of Ondo, for instance, where uh, in 2015, it's one of the only states, if you disaggregate Nigeria's data, it achieved the MDGs in health. And when you look at the system it had, it had a sectoral expenditure framework, capable institutions at the state level, strong leadership results orientation and accountability mechanisms. Ekiti State in Nigeria, for instance. So there are many of those examples, but I think the common theme is really local, uh, strong national leadership that is oriented to the needs of the citizens and that also builds state capacity to be able to deliver what the citizens uh, needed. So it's a bit as much uh, about governance and leadership uh, as it is uh, perhaps technical. So it's not a technical issue which is sort of the way the usual sort of development actors think about it. Health financing is a straight line. 15%, why is it 15%? That's yeah. not the way it is. No, great. I see you nodding, Chikwe. Any thoughts on that? <laughs> this is good. This, this is beyond my sphere of influence. But uh, I, I do think uh, just one point to this is whatever system that we, we need to move on, we, we actually need to build consensus around it. In Nigeria, the context I know the most, we have a mixture of tax-funded health insurance for a few people, and most people are still paying out of pocket uh, an unregulated private sector where financing it is completely inefficient. So in addition to the absolute lack, there's a, a relative lack of resources because the little that we have, we are not managing it in a, efficiently. So. Uh, I, there is a big political decision that needs to be made. How do we finance our health system? And then to push on holding that and making it work. Right now, because we haven't decided uh, in the Nigerian context, I don't know how much that is the case in other African countries. Therefore, we have a, a, a mix of various inputs, outputs that no one can actually, actually say how much 
we spend as a society on health. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. As we come to a close, I was just wondering, you know, if we had Africa's finance ministers, central bank governors, and other health ministers and the private captains of industry in this panel today, uh, what one thing you will say to them, since you all know as the experts that the next pandemic is not an issue of debate, it, it will come, we just don't know when. What one thing would you tell these policymakers to really focus on, starting with you, Tolu? So my takeaway and the key message that I would want to impart to policymakers is that they should take lessons from the effort that we saw in the pandemic where mm -hmm. due to unprecedented collaboration, due to uh, immense financing, due to the highest levels of governance, really claiming a stake um, in the vaccine, controlling the pandemic, we're able to shrink vaccine production from the average 10-year tenure mm -hmm. to a one-year process, right, where we were able to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And this was due to government leadership, right, uh, and engaging the right stakeholders in pi private and public sector, right. So they need to take the same kind of approach and see the vaccine manufacturing production uh, and the lack of it as an existential crisis, right? It's And it's not because of COVID-19, it's because we have traditionally relied on foreign mechanisms to have a, a steady supply of local vaccine production. And the pandemic has, has proven a case in, as a case in point that that is not sustainable. And that leaves us in a very insecure and vulnerable position. Right? So treat it as an existential crisis. Make sure you draw the attention uh, and the urgency of the issue to the highest levels. Um, and, and engage the right stakeholders uh, and hold them accountable, track uh, and define your, your success uh, measures uh, and ensure sustainability in the process. This is not a sprint, this is a marathon. Thank you, thank you very much. Christian, any thoughts? What you will tell our ministers assembled here? Uh, I will say that um, they should all know that we should, as a continent, invest, invest in our health security. The future of Africa is inextricably related to its investment in health security. For some miracle, this pandemic somehow spread the continent, but we are not sure what the next one is gonna be. And we have to prepare today as if the next one was gonna to be tomorrow. So we really need to prioritize this and we really need to put this in the front burner. It's gonna take a lot, but at the same time, I don't believe that it's impossible. I know that our leadership, if they want to do it, they will do it. It's just a matter of deciding and making it a priority. Thank you. Stephen, same point. Yes, uh, investing is in health is good economics. Mm -hmm. So any policies uh, that they have that would lead to um, aggregating investment uh, in health would be good economics, uh, be it in terms of supply side or demand side. And uh, finally, um, our economies are very small. So collaborating, uh, coordinating, uh, cooperating, uh, both in terms of um, pooling their procurement and channeling that to uh, a portion of that to local uh, local manufacturers would actually be good for the future sustainability uh, of our continent. Thank you. Chikwe, any thoughts, what you will share with our policymakers? Um, just one thought, the, to our, our the challenges are complex yeah. and we have to embrace that complexity and solve for it. There, there are no simple <laughs> answers left out there. 
this is not something we can bring in um, Julius Berger to build the next big bridge for us. Uh, it's, it's, it's a mix of financing, research, education, thinking of an ecosystem. Um, and so we have to find the appropriate resources, human resources, which we have evidenced by this panel uh, to deal with this and listen to what they say. And then with determination and uh, grit, take that forward into the future. Thank you very much. Mohammed. what would you tell your contemporaries and peers? <laughs> I, I will not talk to them because um, they are too powerful. <laughs> They're very powerful, have power at their hands, and they have been spoken to by WHO and ECA and others. I would rather talk to the African people to say, of the ante, mm -hmm. put pressure on the feet of the leaders to provide what you need in terms of health services, education services. Vote out incompetent leaders peacefully through democratic means without getting into the conflict that we're seeing in parts of West Africa, for example. And that is the key to hold those leaders accountable to deliver what the African people actually need. That is the key to long-term development, to peace, to security, uh, to investing in health security as well as health systems. All of that will not happen if I just limit myself to talking to the ministers who are very important, but they are powerful and can deploy their power and they know the what. Yes. And to get the will, I think the African people, we need to talk more to them to raise up the ante about yes. the urgency of the here and now yes. and what they need for the future. Uh, on that note, let me thank each and every one of our panelists for an engaging discussion today. Tolu, thank you very much. Christian, thank you for making the time. And Stephen, thank you. Chikwe, thank you very much. And Mohammed, a very, very good thank you from AGI at Brookings Institution. Thank you very much, you all. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.